I am in 2 Samuel, and I want you to know that you're cruising through the life of David, and it's going incredibly well until you hit chapter 11. The first 10 chapters, boy, is he doing well. Chapter 5, Jerusalem becomes the city of David, and Jebus falls, and, and by um, chapters 8, 9, and 10, there are fabulous uh, victories going on on every side, but then you get to the phrase at the beginning of 11. What is the phrase, class? It happened in the spring. Bambi was eating in the yard, butterflies were going by, you know, you can hear the background music, and David isn't where he belongs doing what he's supposed to be doing, and so he finds himself with extra time on his hands, and remember, idleness is the devil's work, because being in the wrong place gives you time, uh, being in the, uh, in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, gives you no time to be in the wrong place, at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing. And so David finds himself positioned beautifully for a temptation situation. Uh, aside from the fact that he was an adulterer and murderer, he was really a good guy. And uh, the thing I want you to know about him is that uh, David not only went off the rails when it came to um, purity, but also had a, a significant problem when it came to dealing with his family. So. We've been studying in chapter 12 some of the issues in relationship to uh, Solomon's final, uh, finally born. David has come out of mourning. But then David doesn't really turn his attention back to his family, and he's already lacking attention on his kingly task. The fact that he's not at war when his people are at war is a problem. The fact that he's not parenting when his kids are going bonkers, that's a problem. Both of those things will come back and, and, and really bite him. And when you get to chapter 13, you see probably one of the critical uh, moments that break out in his life. One of the results of compromises that have gone on a long time in his life. You, you can compromise for quite a while and you can not notice it, but all of a sudden something happens and it breaks loose and the problem develops and becomes uh, palpable. All of a sudden you can see in every direction, boy, this is really not working out. And chapter 13, Amnon, remember all the sons of David that begin with A are a problem. Whether it's Amnon, Adonijah, Absalom, if it starts with an A, he's a bad guy and he's going to have some problems. But uh, at any rate, Amnon um, decides that he loves his half-sister because he spells love L-U-S-T, like a lot of people on the radio. And he finds himself in a situation where he ultimately pulls her in and rapes her. And then hates her and finds himself um, with a sister, half-sister, whose heart is broken. And when you get to the end of the story, you simply read that David got mad when he heard about it. He was upset. Well, you think, oh my, isn't that so harsh? You're hurt, you're upset. But the important part about the story is that when David heard about it, he did nothing. And time went on. I want to pick up the story in 1321, if I can. 2 Samuel 1321. Now, when King David heard all these matters, he was very angry. Well, now, isn't that good? I'm just mad. He did nothing about it. There was no forward progress. But boy, he felt something. I need you to hear something. And there are there's a dividing line in this room. It's not necessarily by age, but it's starting to look like it. Um, there's an awful lot of people that live in our world today, guys, and I mean this very sincerely, who think making a plan is doing something. Who think liking something on Facebook is, have, is taking action against it. We are increasingly being duped. I need you to understand something. Because you feel enraged doesn't actually do anything to anyone in the world but you. You can read about it and go, that's terrible what they did. Ah! But that doesn't actually have a positive effect. So what I read is in verse 21, David heard these things and he was angry. Great. But the energy from the disappointment and hurt should have translated into, and then David began to do this in active and proactive parenting. That's not what happened. He didn't do anything. But he was angry. You need to be careful. There's a big difference between planning to get a job and getting a job. 
I'm very serious about that because I talk to people all the time, they go, but I made this plan, as if that should pay your bills. You actually have to then do it. And one of the problems with parenting is that we were in a situation where if it's not consistent over a long haul, you can't do flash fry parenting. All it does is burn children. Flash fry parenting. I'm going to come and take you to Disney and be Mr. Dad, Super Dad for like two days and then not be dad for the next six months. That's not how it works. David finds himself in a really rough situation that he created. The compromises that existed in his, in his private and spiritual life spilled over into compromising his position as king and now spilled over into obvious ways of compromising the way he's dealing with his children. It's interesting because remember what's the Davidic promise? What is the great thing that God told David that is unique? Dennis doesn't have this. Jonathan doesn't have this. What does David, what is the covenant God makes with David that's so unique? Your line, if you'll be faithful to me, will go on and on and on. How many of you think, well then, the thing you'd really pay attention to is your line? If your covenant is about your line, if the promise of God is about your line, why are you giving no time to your children to sculpt the future king? We have... 15 chapters of how God sculpted David's life on the run. But we have precious little about how David took one minute to sculpt the one that would follow him. I think it's interesting when you get to verse 23. I want to talk today about unresolved conflict. And I want to talk from specifically the end of chapter 13. I'm going from, from verse 21 down to verse 38. I, I want to give a couple of rules for unresolved conflicts. Unresolved conflicts are conflicts that you know you have, they come from a spiritual root, but it just seems harder to deal with it than to put it off. So you leave it. Um, let me put it in the physical realm. There's a squeaking in your car. Y you know it's there and it's getting worse, and so what you're going to do is ignore it and turn the radio up. Because after all, you don't want to deal with the problem in your car. Here's what I know. Things tend not to fix themselves. So let's take a look at some of the unresolved conflict axioms or rules. Rule number one for unresolved conflict is in verses 21 and 22, and it is unresolved conflict goes underground. It goes underground. Here's what I mean. David heard about the rape of his daughter by Amnon. He became very angry, but when he failed to act on the information, Amnon carried on as if he hadn't done anything wrong, and because David didn't do anything about it, there was no way to relieve the situation. Tamar was hurt. Amnon was living a lie that he had gotten away with something. There was a show on the Discovery Channel a few years ago bunch of Canadian park rangers were digging holes on this island and they were dumping water in the holes and the host of the show came up and said uh, what do you guys do and they said we're putting out fires and the guy's looking around and he doesn't see any fire and he says oh no oh no this see this tree right here and they start showing him the tree he said this tree's on fire and so is the one next to it and the one next to that and if we don't put out the underground fire that is burning the roots of these trees the entire island will die he said, put your hand down here. The guy put his hand down there, fell a rock, and it burned. And there spread out in the root system of this tree, and the two trees next to it, all started by a camper who made a fire next to a root system, didn't know it would be picked up underground, and because the roots had air underneath of them and trapped that air, it was able to burn underground and was continuing an underground fire. See, what happens when you don't address the kind of sin that is in David's life and in his family is it, it goes underground. Just because you don't see the results don't mean the results aren't coming. That squeak that you're turning the radio up for, that squeak just got a couple hundred dollars more expensive. And I'm going to tell you something, and none of you are going to believe me in your 20s. Put off all the dental work you want. They'll get back from you everything they lost in your 30s. I promise you that will happen. Because you're going to go, yeah, I'm 22, I shouldn't have to do this. Can you spell root canal? Because you're going to get midway through your 30s and you're going to learn about the joy of root canals. You either do the consistent thing or you pay the big price. 
And things that are underground are harder to detect, which means it's going to take more skill to get to them. Read, it's going to cost you more. So when you deal with the issues of your life right up front, you're not pushing them underground, creating a bigger problem for later. In Dave's home, I think there's an unresolved conflict, and I think it's burning underground. And if he's not going to be willing to dig at the roots and start pouring in some water, he's going to end up with a lot of dead trees. But what's worse is it's going to spread, and it's going to get out of control, and it's going to be very difficult for him to ever... There is a point at which you can't fix relationships because you let them go so long. So my first rule is unresolved conflict goes underground. Look at verse 23. Uh, back to 22. But Absalom did not speak to Amnon, either good or bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Now what's interesting is right in David's house, David is ignoring the problem, the elephant in the room, if you will, and Absalom is falling right into that. He's doing exactly what his dad's doing. The difference between David and Absalom is Absalom is planning to kill Amnon. David's not. David somehow thinks it's going to work its way out as if you know, rape is one of those things that time will heal. No, it won't heal it. You have a young man who's out of control. By the way, you have another man who's out of control, Absalom, but he hasn't yet pulled the trigger. When I get to the second rule, it's in the second half of verse 22. Unresolved conflict turns yesterday's anger into today's, into today's bitterness. I want you to see this. Today's hurt becomes tonight's anger becomes tomorrow's bitterness. When you meet somebody who's bitter, they used to be hurt. They started being hurt, then they got angry. And anger turned to bitterness. And it, once it ferments into bitterness, it is very difficult to get rid of it. That's why scripture says that the root of bitterness, when it goes out, defiles many. One of the problems is Amnon grew bitter in anger. Absalom grew bitter in anger. Earlier, Amnon grew bitter in anger when he was, was uh, uh, wanting something and feeling like it was his right to have it. Now his brother Absalom, he wants something and he feels like it's his right to have it and it's called revenge. Revenge is what happens in a society where injustice is allowed to foment. The reason you're seeing people hostile on the streets right now is because justice has been slacked in our country. There are people that are getting away with things, and there are a lot of people that are working hard losing them while people who aren't earning them are getting them. And it's making people angry. And if you let that anger go on, it'll foment and ferment into bitterness. So Absalom, the brother of Tamar and the half-brother of Amnon, grew bitter in anger, and, and he didn't speak to Amnon about the rape. I want you to look at the fruit of the unresolved anger in Absalom's life. I want you to see what happens. When you get angry, when you get hurt and allow that hurt to become anger, and then you kind of nurture that anger and let it become bitterness, look what happens. It gives him a fixation and a desire for revenge that likely kept him from accomplishing great things. This is the thing. Somebody asked me this morning, what happens, uh, we were talking about forgiveness in one of the messages, what happens if the other person doesn't ask for forgiveness? You, you need to know something. You can forgive somebody whether they want you to or not. Forgiveness is in your hands. It's not in the other person. You're not a victim. You have the ability to say, I will forgive them. Is it hard? You bet. But if you don't, look, I, I sit down in counseling with people who the person who offended them is dead now. If they don't give this up, it's only going to ruin them. Do you see what's happening to Absalom? He's letting this thing become a fixation, and now he has a desire for revenge. And here's the thing, it's holding him back. Bitterness is going to kill you before it kills the people around you. Your bitterness has to be dealt with. Your anger has to be dealt with. That's one of the reasons I'm going to tell you something, and I mean it from my heart, and you deal with it as the Spirit of God leads you. Be careful of how many people have access to the rage button in your heart. I live in the social media world where everybody constantly feeds me another thing I should be enraged about. The problem is you can only deal with so much rage in your life and you can't fix it all. So here's what happens. You'll end up going boom, 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 boom. I'm, I'm a victim. 
I'm powerless. And instead of getting up and doing one thing you should be doing today, you'll be beat down by 10 things that are too powerful for you to stand up to. And the problem is, evil wins. What, so what do I do? Well, I shut off the accesses of rage in my life. I hardly ever watch a news program of any kind. I read the news. You know why? Because banner ads gone, Pew! next hour, we're going to enrage you new, in a new way, doesn't help me. I just, just give me the facts. Don't interview the dog because you have a 24-7 thing and you've got to keep somebody in front of it so they ask people who don't know anything about it. Don't, don't do that to me. Just give me the facts. I can get them in this much. And you know what? I find that when I read two paragraphs, I know everything that everybody else on the street is talking about and I want to deliberately blow up a lie. God did not make you responsible to know everything about all the conflicts on the planet today. That's what they're selling you. It's not true. Absalom's walking around and he's broken. By the way, it leads him to concoct a plan and hide the truth. Why is he not dealing in truth? The thing that causes you to cover over the truth and, and keep this plan. Have you ever done this? Have you ever been so mad at somebody you thought, I am going to find a way to get them back. And you know what you end up doing? You end up looking past all the wonderful sunsets of those days of your life. And you're all about, I'm going to get him. It led Absalom into believing that he should be the one to repay Amnon. One of the problems with bitterness is it makes us think we're the sheriff. I grew up in a big family, you know that, and there are always people who think they are the dessert sheriffs of the house. Did you have a dessert sheriff in your house? The one who, who ran around going, you got more cake than I got, and like they're the dessert chef. We should just give them like a, you know, a cookie badge or something. I don't know. But, but the important thing is you got some people who are all about the justice of everything. You know what they don't do? Enjoy the cake. They don't enjoy it because they're so busy running around making sure you don't get more than they got. My mom had a rule. One cuts, the other one chooses. So if my brother and I split something, whichever one cut it, the other one got to choose to the first half. It's amazing how exacting children are when that's, I mean, seriously, we had like these calipers and we're trying to make sure who gets the amount, volume of cookie. It, it's amazing. Here's the other thing. It, I don't know if it occurred to you, but it, it, it led Absalom, Absalom to believe that he not only would be the one that repay, would repay, but he, he knew the laws of his day and he knew the only punishment Abnon was uh, going to experience was to marry Tamar. That's what was going to happen. And he didn't like it. That wasn't sufficient for him. So he became judge and jury because he wasn't happy with the law. Now, all of us go through this. The person who passes you on the shoulder of the road going around you when you're sitting dutifully in the long line, you're hoping, honestly, that there's a cop ahead and that he's mean and he doesn't like whatever kind of car they're driving. Or at least, you know, a few tacks or nails or roofing nails on the... I mean, you're really hoping that something happens because injustice gets to the bottom of us. Here's the other thing. It occurs to me that, that it kept Tamar desolate and it depressed her in her home with no hope of getting a just solution. See, David did that, but Absalom contributed to it. By not giving attention to calling to truth, he plotted something. But in the meantime, days and weeks go by and nobody's dealing with it properly. Absalom, uh, uh, by the way, gets together with his slippery friend who seemed to know the plans that Absalom made. We're going to find out that Yonadav is the one who's been hanging around. Watch this guy. He's always there to come in out of the shadows and give bad advice. You will have friends like this. They're usually more fun than your other friends. They really are. They're incredibly fun. But what they're telling you is really badly wrong. It's just that they're really fun. And they'll step in from the sideline just in order to say, sure, you can make it jumping from this building. It won't hurt you. I, um, <laughs> the, true story. Steve Tran of Westminster, California, got so angry about the number of roaches in his apartment. He went and he talked to his landlord, and his landlord wouldn't do anything about it. So he went to Home Depot and he got himself 25 bug bombs in a one-bedroom apartment. And he decided that he was going to, if one was good, two was better, and 25 was even betterer. 
So he set them all off and they, of course, caught the pilot light on the stove and exploded and blew the doors off. $10,000 worth of damage ruined everything he owned. But as he was cleaning up the mess after the fire department had gotten there, the roaches were fine. <laughs> and it's really true. These things are designed to survive a nuclear blast. So let's just say this, unresolved conflict takes hurt that goes to anger, that goes to bitterness. Let, could, could go with me now. Keep reading. Verse 24. Absalom came to the king and he said, Behold now, your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, we should not go, for we will be burdensome to you. Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him, Why should he go with you? But when Absalom urged him, he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Now, stop there for a second. I want you to notice that unresolved conflict does a third thing. It makes sides develop. It makes sides develop. You're going to have the pro-Tamar and the pro-Amnon side. Because a conflict developed and nobody's fixing it. And because Dave wants to be passive, that doesn't make the problem right. What it makes is the room divided. Absalom has taken his stand. He's pro-Tamar, anti-Amnon. Amnon's pro-Amnon. Gee, there's a shock. And, and, and the other brothers are just kind of um, lawn decoration here. He waits two years and eventually invites the entire royal family. Now, David declines going. I think that's interesting. But he gave permission for the others to go. And Absalom asked David's permission to have Amnon attend. And David at first declined, but he talked him into it. And, and Absalom quietly gathered and instructed some men to help him with a plan. Verse 28, Absalom commanded his servants, saying, See now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then put him to death. Do not fear, have I not commanded this myself to you? Be courageous and be valiant. And I would put a little parenthesis and be murderers and lawbreakers. You like me, don't you? Listen, you don't like anybody so much that they convinced you to subvert the law for their purposes. You know why? Because they're not your friend. They're not asking you to break the law because they're your friend. They're asking you to break the law because they don't have the courage to do it themselves. And so in reality, here, <laughs> here he is. You see this? Absalom uses the same method Amnon used to rape Tamar. He, they both put together, remember, remember in, the, in the rape story? You know, oh, Yonadav says, just lay there in bed and moan and say, I need Tamar to come in and make some cakes for me and then I'll be okay. Dumb story. Guess what? Who did they enlist to get permission for Tamar to be in the room with Amnon? Dave. So at the heart of the story is a, is a dad who wasn't paying attention when the rape actually occurred and was part and parcel of the reason it was able to be set up. And now he's getting sucked in and suckered again by his kids. All of a sudden, he's starting to enlist people to his side, just as with, um, as with uh, uh, Amnon and Yonadav, there was a, a side created. Here, there's a side being created. Okay. Here's the thing. The problem with unresolved conflict is it creates sides. And Absalom gathers and instructs men to kill him. And, and, and he says, this is when to do it. This is how to do it. It's, it's interesting to me that they needed to be encouraged to do the killing. That's kind of good. It says something about them. What it doesn't say is that they couldn't be encouraged to do the killing, which says something else about them. Absalom is, 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 is in the middle of this thing. And here's what I want you to see. There's another rule. Let's try this one in verses 29 to 33. Unresolved conflict will push to the surface in some form of pain. When it comes up, it's going to hurt. When it comes up, it's not going to be pretty. Unresolved conflict is an emotional stomach ache. And when it comes up, it's not going to be pretty. I'm trying to be a little bit graphic here. Work with me, Ashley. Come on. Now, here's the point. You get to verse 29, and it says, uh, The servants of Absalom did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. Yeah. One brother killed the other one. I think it's a good time to, like, maybe go somewhere. 
So they all got in their VWs and took off over the hill. Verse 30, now it was while that they were on the way that the report came to David saying, Absalom has struck down all the king's sons and not one of them is left. I want you to stop there and notice something. When rage comes out, the first report and the first stories are probably not accurate. But can I just say this? When trouble happens, the first reports are seldom accurate. People try to know things fast, but knowing them well and knowing them fast are usually at odds with each other. Be careful, because we live in this news cycle where everybody wants to know all the details fast. The first five things they tell you on the news probably aren't accurate, but they've got some shred, and so they're going to give it to you. One of the problems we have then is it, it taints how the rest of the story goes, because most of us are not fixated on the story, so we only hear pieces of it. Then we try the person on Facebook and make them guilty, when we really never actually heard all the facts, what we heard were pieces of things that we tied together in our mind. Here's what I know about us. I know that we resolve any conflict by filling in the gap with what we thought. And so in the end, you end up not really having a fair situation. Here's what I want you to see. Verse 30 says that not one of them is left. That wasn't true. Then the king arose, tore his clothes, lay on the ground, and all his servants were standing by, by with clothes torn. Yonadav, oh, here he comes. Back from the shadows, on the edge. The guy who was the original planner and plotter of the rape for Amnon shows up in the dialogue again. Yonadav, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, responded, do not let my lord suppose that they have put, all, uh, put to death all of the young men the king's sons, for Amnon alone is dead because of the intent of Absalom that was determined since the day that he was violated by his sister, uh, that since the day he violated his sister Tamar. Here's, here's the best part. Yonadav is walking around going, yeah, I got the whole plan right here. This is all, they, were, they didn't kill them all because uh, they were only killing this one. Now, the very first thing Dave should have said is, you will never speak to my children again, Yonadav. You are a mental case. We need to help you now. Let's get this guy off the scene. You mean you're walking around with the details of how my child was going to kill my other child and you're okay with that? But that's not where Dave goes. Dave is very sharp about some things, but he's not sharp about this. So at first, the inaccurate messages come to him that all sons are killed and he starts to react. This is what I want you to see. I'm known reacted to lust. Absalom reacted to Amnon. David reacted and overreacted to the news, just like he did when he reacted to lust with Bathsheba. The problem with all these guys, honestly, is one thing, impulse control. It's a family of people who are incredibly impulsive. So I want to, I want to stop and I want to ask you something. How impulsive is your family? Do you have a family that like does the um, Mediterranean fly off the handle thing? Ah! And now we're going to have coffee and feel better. See, the problem is when we can't not say what we should not say, we have a problem with impulse control. Yeah, I know. I'm 20 pounds overweight. I'm working on it, though. The point is impulse control shows up in a lot of places. It does. And we have to work at it. And it takes work. Did, did you ever get to the place, did you ever have somebody say something to you and you so were burning inside, you were just deciding in your mind, do I answer them back right now? Oh, that was nasty. How could you say that to me? Did you ever have somebody post something and you were just, you were just, you were just wanting to pounce and give them the 14 page response? That article's terrible. How could you possibly say this? Here's the thing I need you to understand. Impulse control, the ability to say, yes, somebody needs to deal with it, but it's not my job, and I'm not the person who's going to. And I'm going to release this situation into the hands of authorities who can deal with it, and I'm not the authority who can deal with it. That's the ability to discipline your own controls. Amnon, I, I, look at the pain. Look at where the pain comes out. And for Amnon, how many of you think for Amnon, it just wasn't worth it. He, um, he lusted after his half-sister. He took her. Then he hated her. Then he ends up in a pool of blood. How many of you think, just as he's going down, he's thinking, man, that wasn't worth it. 
You think anybody thought, well, you know, do you think that for a moment Amnon was going down, boy, it was so worth it. So let's start off with you um, go through life with a partner. When you came to Christ, that partner stayed in your life. You've known this partner, and they are with you so much of the time that they've accommodated their way in your life, and you're just used to them being there. They're there till we die. When we get out of bed, we go in the bathroom and brush our teeth. When we go to school, when we get ready to go to work, when we get in the car, when we come back home, every moment of your life, this partner has been walking alongside of you. This partner's name is Temptation. They've been with you for so long that they're just part of the furniture. And um, by the way, you can't pray to God to get rid of that partner. It's not God's job to rid you of all temptation. You can ask the Lord to give you strength in temptation. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying the condition of the fallen world isn't going to change because you don't want to discipline yourself. You can't walk around and go, well, God, I just need you to not have any of them be attractive to me. That's really not going to work, okay? What you can do is decide to put your eyes where they belong and put your heart where it belongs. Now, in reality, Amnon ends up in a situation where the pain comes out, and it's not worth it, but I want you to understand what happened to him. Listen to the process of his life. What started out as a harmless thought about his half-sister led to his partner temptation speaking into his life, which ran into a little bit of bad advice and refused to consider the consequences. This is what we do. This is how we make a bad decision. We go, I want, I want, I want. Let's fixate on what I want, what I want, what I want. Let's forget all the consequences. Let's not look at what could go wrong. Let's not look at whether or not God is happy or whether or not this will destroy relationships. It's what I want. And all of a sudden, what I want becomes everything. And then he went ahead and took what was desired, which led him to be lying in a pool of his own blood with no possibility of escape. And my point is, that's where temptation seeks to lead you. Temptation wants to yield sin, and sin yields death. Now, I'm not saying right that minute. Amnon's been walking around scot-free for two years. I'm saying, be sure your sin will find you out. That's what I'm saying. What about the brothers? Okay, so we got some, um, we got, in Amnon's life it wasn't worth it. The pain showed up in the, as he falls to the floor in the dramatic sequence and lies there bleeding out. It's not worth it. Okay, what about the royal brothers? Is anybody on the page with me? I'm thinking they don't have a family barbecue for generations after this. I'm thinking they don't trust each other. They're not getting better for a bar mitzvah. They're not going to be in the same place. I'm thinking Dave could send royal invitations, and I think most of the brothers are going to go, <coughs> I'm sick, sorry. Why? Because what happened to the family was the suspicions would haunt the family for generations. Well, what about Absalom? First, Absalom attracts some flies in his life. <sighs> Who, who showed up in Absalom's life after Amnon sinned? Who's walking around with the paper that knows exactly what's going to happen? Yonadav. See, Amnon's friend Yonadav became, after Amnon did wrong, Absalom's friend Yonadav. And what you have is the same dark figure walking through the story causing mayhem everywhere he goes. Watch, watch for your Yonadav, because they are out there. There are people who, in their wake of their life, lead people to destruction, one after another after another. And you sit there and you go to yourself, how can one person cause so much trouble? And did you notice Yonadav's fingerprints aren't on anything? Whoever told you evil was stupid? Evil's smart. Evil has websites. Evil has high tech. Evil has digital media. Evil has a PR firm. Evil has lipstick. Evil knows how not to look like what it is. And I'm asking you to be very, very careful. Guys, I can teach you all the Bible I can teach you, but if you don't get wise, 
that there is an enemy out there who's leaving Paul prints all over the place and many of your contemporary Christian friends will not be able to tell their lion prints when they're looking at them. Get used to the mark of the devil. Learn where he is. Find the person or people that are leaving terror and trouble in their wake. And in your own mind, mark them. And by the way, the New Testament is going to teach you, mark them. You don't have to run around and post them on Facebook and say they're evil. You just have to know not to be where they are on Saturday night. Because whoever's in the room where they are is going to get hit with some of the slop they're walking around with. So I'm thinking that to the royal brothers, it was a letdown. I'm thinking to Absalom, he's attracting the wrong people in his life. He, he had to leave Tamar and not see her again. He goes off after this killing and he goes wandering off and he goes to Geshur and he stays away. So whatever comfort he was going to bring to Tamar by, by killing the person that raped her, he was gone now for the next three years. He wasn't even going to be able to see his sis. What about Dave? Where do you think he's at in the story? He's standing there now with his ripped clothing, mourning, upset. He's standing there wondering why Yonadav is, knows the inside out of a terrible plan in his family, and he doesn't. And, and the interesting thing is, Yonadav's counsel, did you catch it in verse 32? Do not let my Lord suppose that they have put to death all the young men. Only this one is dead. Like, Hey, I got a consolation prize for you. The other ones aren't dead. Any dad worth anything isn't going, well, as long as I got two others that look just like him. I mean, that's not how this works. He just lost a son. What is wrong with you? Verse 33 says, Now therefore do not let my lord the king take the report to heart, namely all the king's sons are dead, for only Amnon is dead. Underline, for only Amnon is dead. He only killed one of them. Seriously? That's what you're going with? He only killed one of your kids? Let me go to the end of this story and say that I think there's a fifth rule. And let me pose this to you. Unresolved conflict becomes a pattern of dysfunction. For some reason, when we don't resolve conflict, another conflict comes up, we learn not to resolve conflict. We learn to, let me say it this way, we learn to live with the discomfort of sustained unresolved conflict. We, we just start, the, the, the problems stay there. It's funny because you don't know this, but in the back of the room are some people who have watched this go on for years and they know exactly what I'm saying. There's always uncle whoever who's always been a problem in the family, but we've all just gotten used to him being a problem. So we just leave it alone. Why? Because what else are you going to do? He's, you got to invite him or you feel bad. Now, here's the thing. Absalom fled to his grandfather's kingdom in the kingdom of Geshur. I want you to pick up the reading in verse 34. Now, Absalom fled, and the young man who was the watchman raised his eyes and looked, and behold, many people were coming from the road behind him by the side of the mountain. Yonadav said to the king, Behold, the king's sons have come. According to your servant's word, so it happened. Yonadav is just there to say, By the way, I was right. This guy, honestly, follow his character all the way through the Bible. There's almost nothing that's not detestable about him. Then it says, Yonadav said to the king, Behold, the king's son, uh, sons have come. Verse 36, As soon as he had finished speaking, behold, the king's sons came and lifted their voices and wept, and also the king and all his servants wept very bitterly. Absalom fled. He went to Telmai, the son of Amihud, the king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. Absalom fled and when he had gone to Geshur and was there for three years. The heart of King David longed to go out to Absalom, for he, he was comforted concerning Amnon since he was dead. That, that reads awkwardly in English. What he's, what, if I were translating it, I would say, when David got over the loss of Amnon, then he missed Absalom. I think that's the point of the passage. Now, when we're in Israel, I'll show you that Geshur is actually a city that gets destroyed by the Assyrians, and when it's re rebuilt, it's in the New Testament. It's called Beit Saida. And Beit Saida is where, you know, the Zebedee and F Sons Fishing Company Incorporated was located in the Gospels. But it's actually on top of the territory of Talmai, king of Geshur. This is an alliance. Um, David marries the mother 
and creates this alliance. And this foreign kingdom is where Absalom went. Where did he go? He went to his grandparents. He went to his grand grandpa's house. David's a lot like Absalom, and Absalom's a lot like David. You're going to find that this is really true. I know, I, I don't know if I should be the one to break it to you, but you may be more like your mom or more like your dad than you think. And some of the things that bug you the most, just wait another 10 years and you're going to be channeling their voice. You're going to sound just like them, and increasingly you're going to look in the mirror and look just like them, and that's really going to freak you out. And, and the truth of the matter is, over time, what you're going to see is that Sometimes their stubbornness is your stubbornness. Some of you are not at all like a parent, and, and that works well. Some of you are so much like them that all of your relationship seems to feel like that. It's because you're both hard-headed. And by the way, you can run around telling them, well, you made me, and that's, it's really your fault. But it's really not. You're an adult now. It's time to put the adult pants on and actually take responsibility for your life. I think what's interesting is that David's story is just one among many in this world and, and hurts present in families everywhere. Hurts happen, They're, they happen in homes, but here's the thing, in spite of the serious hurt that can happen, even in a family, healing can also happen in a home. But two things are required. Somewhere along the end of the story, mark down the two things are required to resolve conflict. One of them is honesty. Healing will not happen by ignoring problems or pretending they don't exist. Nothing gets solved by covering it over with a coat of paint and acting like it's not there. Before he died, Chuck Colson told the story of Carly Santi. Carly Santi, for years, was raised in a home without her father. And uh, her mother told her when she got to be a certain age that dad actually went to jail. She was so devastated when she found out as a young teen that she lied to everybody in her life and she felt ashamed. And even though she had done nothing wrong, the fact that her father was in jail just made her ashamed. And so one time uh, her mother sent her to a camp and it was a camp for children of convicted criminals. It was sponsored by Colson's ministry. And um, she got into the camp and she was struggling at being mad at God. She was struggling with being mad at her father. She was struggling with being mad at her mother, who was in an impossible situation, really, if you think about it. She accepted Christ as her savior at the camp. And in fact, uh, that began a process of healing. But she said, the thing that healed me the most was when we could, my mom and I could sit down and talk honestly about how we felt about the situation. She said, for the first time I felt like an adult because my mother wasn't hiding what happened from me. She was actually talking to me about it. And then she said, the whole thing, the healing actually occurred before my father ever got out of prison. She said, um, I found out that Prison Fellowship also had a meeting in the prison, so I went to see my dad. My dad hadn't seen me in years. And she said, I sat across from him and he was humiliated. He couldn't look me in the eye. And she said, I need you to hear me for a minute. You're not some guy, you're my dad. And he teared up and he looked at her. And he said, I have humiliated you. She said, I know, but you're still my dad. Something about that statement helped him and pushed him to go to the prison fellowship meeting where he surrendered his life to Christ. By the time they got out, by the way, they now, this family now works as part of prison fellowship, but by the time he got out, honesty and confession were the basis of the healing of all the relationships. So the first thing that has to happen is there has to be honesty. People have to tell the truth. As long as you're lying about the situation, real healing will not occur. Apparent healing can occur, but real healing doesn't occur. Unresolved conflicts, Honestly, it's like unresolved mold issues. You can wipe it off, it's coming right back. Uh, how many of you have, uh, you, you wipe off the thing in the bathroom and it comes right back? Here's the thing, until you resolve the issue, it's not gone. You can bleach that thing to death and all you've done is take away the surface. The, the second thing besides honesty is change. There has to be a willingness to stop the things that are continuing to hurt. 
The word repentance in the Bible, in the New Testament, is metanoeo. It means to turn around completely. The idea is this. There has to be a willingness to not continue down the road that we've been on. It's great that you're going to be honest about what happened there, but then tomorrow something else is going to come up and we're going to have to face it honestly. The great secret about conflict is that there's a real promise behind it. I want you to hear this before we get a break here. The great secret is this. It's true. Conflict can really decimate a home. But resolved conflict can create an intimacy that never would have been there without the conflict. In other words, when God fits together broken pieces of relationships, they're often stronger than the original before it was broken. And unresolved conflict can drive you apart, but if you face it squarely and deal with it, it can bring you closer together. And I think there are many, many circumstances. Here's the problem. You just get so used to not dealing with things that it's just easier to not deal with them. But they're going to come back and, and get you. It's really going to be hard in your life.